Welcome and thank you for taking time to view this recorded webinar on today. The State Board of Education in the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, NCDPI, in consultation with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, NCDHHS, have developed a booklet called Lighting Our Way Forward, North Carolina's Guidebook for Reopening Public Schools in response to the COVID-19 public health crisis. The purpose of this guidance document is to support the North Carolina schools and communities in developing their plans and strategies for reopening schools in the 2021 school year. As public school units, we work to operationalize the requirements and recommendations and it is critical to be intentional and prepared for change as the year unfolds in light of the public health needs. The focus of our time today will be to provide a brief overview of the operation support portion of the North Carolina's guidance on reopening K-12 public schools. My name is James Ellaby, and I'm joined today by colleagues Kevin Harrison, and Carl Logan, and you would hear from them a little bit shortly. We serve as the leads for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction work group on operations. We are appreciative of the time and expertise contributed by all the members of our work group, consisting of the practitioners in the field across our state, as well as across the staff in NCDPI. In response to the direction prov uh, provided by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, NCDPI is prepared to give some guidance through the document that we have shared today. The document is rather large, and I would like to take the opportunity to show you the document. As you can see, lighting our way forward, North Carolina's Guidebook for Reopening Public Schools is on our screen. To the left, you will see a bunch of tables that gives all the content that is located in this booklet. Please take time to scroll through. There are specific topics you may be looking for, and all you have to do is click that topic and it will take you to the information that is needed, just as illustrated. Also on the booklet, you will see that there are several plans and the requirements are listed, but we also gave some considerations for operations. In our booklet, it is a requirement that there are three operational plans. And this requirement is by the Department of Health and Human Services for operating schools this coming year. Plan A is a minimal social distance plan. Plan B is a moderate social distancing plan. And plan C is a remote learning plan. In case that schools are closed, you will be able to go into this booklet and see some of the recommendations that are made in order to close school. There may be staff that still will be working even in plan C. So some guidelines for cleaning, guidelines for protecting uh, the employees and the safety component still would have to be addressed. At this time, as we go into our operations webinar, we'd like to start with transportation and that will be led by none other than Kevin Harrison. Thank you, James. Good morning. Um, on the transportation side, there are quite a few, uh, quite a few requirements. Uh, a K through 12 transportation overview. So, student transportation really supports students' access to education at the school. Um, it is without a doubt that many students would be unable to attend successfully without it. But we've also seen transportation in emergency school buses used for other purposes, such as logistical support to students like distribution of materials, internet access, as well as nutritional support. Um, 
as a logistical operation, and keeping in mind all of these things uh, throughout this presentation, the primary issues uh, for a school district involve the constraints placed upon the transportation department. There are many, many different legs of the stool to balance, ride times, school start times, and dismissal times, the age range of students that are allowed to be transported together in your district, uh, the funding that is available, and social distancing and cleaning requirements now. And you will have to make different considerations depending on the situation, but but also what uh, matters to you. So you can vary, for example, school start and dismissal times and provide wider uh, arrival times for students, and that eases some of the burdens on and the costs on transportation. So there are lots of different decisions you can make, matter of priorities. I wanted to start with a Plan C, the remote learning plan, because from a school transportation perspective, um, that is um, what we've been doing most recently, and it is the most unlike anything school transportation has done before. So you can use buses for emergency uh, purposes if there is a declared state of emergency, state or local, um, and uh, those uses could include school nutrition support, print material distribution and collection, Wi-Fi hotspots, or other things. Um, I will tell you, however, that it is not funded by PRC 056, those emergency operations, under current allotment policy. Uh, it is through June 30th, but that flexibility ends June 30th. Preparations for Plan C. If you're going to be distributing school nutrition via the bus, some districts have removed seats from school buses. That can be done. You can install Wi-Fi equipment. Please do that in consultation with your DPI field consultant. Post any required federal signage on, again, that's on the nutrition side, and consider posting other appropriate signage as well, but don't cover required signage and safety instructions. To operationalize Plan C, you should, of course, screen all staff daily and should only allow those that pass that screening process. You should follow social distancing requirements, distancing requirements to the maximum extent you can at meal and materials distribution locations. We know that that's not always possible. And so wear appropriate PPE for the level of close contact, whatever that is. And so uh, this, uh, in addition to providing procedures to parents, how do they access the resources that you are making available is the biggest question um, that they need to know in Plan C. So assuming you're actually transporting students to school, there's some critical information for transportation, and I put this up front. You must know as soon as possible who is coming to school, not just an idea of a few people um, or 20, 75 percent of the 100 percent, but who is coming to school by their UID and when. Who, and in addition to that, who will ride the school bus to which school, because it may not be their usual one, by UID and on what scheduled, if not every day. So are they going Monday and Tuesday? Are they going Monday and Friday? Are they going, what's their schedule? Or are they going this week, but not next week? Transportation needs an initial guest at least a month ahead in order to actually create a plan which will get children there. Um, if you can't give them some significant lead time, you will have uh, real issues with that transportation plan. A refined answer uh, a couple of weeks prior to the start of school, something that they can lock down on two weeks prior to school. And while it's generally important, when you limit resources significantly, you have to be very careful. So a 72 passenger bus that you put 65 passengers on, elementary school students on, that's not such a big deal. You lost a few students and did, didn't one totally full. But when you get down to 10 passengers on a bus and five of them don't show up at the bus stop this morning, you have a big problem uh, resource wise and you've wasted a lot of time and resources. Operationally, we're talking about closed to students, which could be a single school or all the schools, um, a hybrid model where students are grouped by whatever, anything you have decided in your own plan, or a traditional model where all the schools are going. The use of the school buses, uh, I talked about briefly before, but in the hybrid model, you can, could consider a little bit of both. You're going to try and limit the number of students on the bus to the extent possible in any of these plans. So plan A, 
the DHHS, uh, wow, DHHS requirements for Plan A, minimal distancing. Um, these are listed in the document from DHHS, the Public Health Toolkit, and are available. Clean and disinfect transportation vehicles regularly. Children must not be present when the vehicle is being clean. You must ensure safe and correct usage and storage of those things and adequate ventilation when they use those products. They want you to clean and disinfect frequently touch surfaces of the vehicle. You don't have to disinfect the entire surface area, but you do need to disinfect the surfaces in the driver's area, seats, doors, anything people are going to touch regularly. Um, keep the doors and windows open when cleaning the vehicle and between trips, of course, to the extent possible because you know you can't leave them open in the rain, but you want the vehicles to air out. The big consideration in, I think, facilities is, and, and in transportation as well is that fresh air is better than indoor air. So clean and sanitize and disinfect equipment is anything that might be used. So if there's wheelchairs or other adaptive equipment that you're transporting. Um, generally, those would be the students, but if you have uh, harnesses or other types of things like that, you need to disinfect that equipment. Provide hand sanitizer to support hygiene of students, but that hand sanitizer should not be on the vehicle if the vehicle is not in use. All right, continuing, um, you have to follow a symptom screening protocol. Uh, that screening protocol is the same one that would be done at the school. Or alternatively, you can create a parent and guardian attestation. Uh, that is information is also provided um, in the DHHS document. And individuals who either do not have the attestation or do not pass the screening can't board the transportation vehicle. Um, upon arrival at school, students don't need to be rescreened if you actually did a screening on the side of the road. But if you just did a sign-off sheet, uh, then they do have to be officially screened at the school. And then create a plan for getting students home safely if they're not allowed to board that vehicle. That is a DHHS requirement. Enforce that if an inv individual becomes sick during the day, they can't use transportation school buses to return home and have to also get home safely in some other means, and you need a plan for that. And then if a driver becomes sick during the day, this, this seems pretty obvious, they, can't, they also can't return and drive students. So if a driver becomes sick during the day, they pass a screening in the morning, but they notice becoming sick during the day, they still have to, um, they're done for the day whenever they notice that they're not doing well. All right, so Plan B enhances those requirements to indicate that the density of facilities and transportation is limited to 50% maximum occupancy. To be fair, in a school bus, you can't get anywhere near that with social distancing of at least six far, feet, of, feet apart between people at all times. Plan C, schools closed. Follow all social distancing requirements from anyone entering the building. And then no staff or students should be gathering in groups in this plan. That's straight from DHHS's requirements. So lighting our way forward on the school bus side from the State Board of Education. Your initial considerations are increase flexibility. Okay, encourage walking, biking, and carpooling. Consider allowing students from the same household to be seated together if you have the space on the bus and if you're in the right plan. Consider creating a pathway for parents who need student transportation to find carpool options. This is something that we see commonly uh, on the charter school side, but we don't see it commonly on the, on the LEA side because um, school buses are a very safe means of transportation. But when you don't have the space on school buses and you're worried about contagious diseases, school buses are not always the best choice. Initial considerations to increase flexibility may also consider uh, student transportation flexibility restrictions, things that you normally allow students to do but that you may need to stop, uh, which is enforce potentially the no transport zones to the legislated maximum of 1.5 miles. Many uh, districts, if there's not a safe walking path, will not uh, will transport from across the street from the school if there's no crosswalk and no sidewalks. But 
um, you may need to consider enforcing that no transport zone. It's not a walk zone, it's just that we're not providing transportation within that area. Consider limiting all the planned alternate stop locations. Um, if a student was going to be on one bus in the afternoon and a different bus in the morning, uh, that's not, you want to consider stopping that because it makes contact tracing nearly impossible, exponentially increases it, especially given that all those kids are not going to go to the same place in the school. Consider not allowing students to alter their bus assignments temporarily. Nobody's riding home with friends anymore. And multiple bus runs to the same school, wider arrival and departure windows, and you must support those efforts with earlier screening and longer in-classroom supervision. On the staff side, you want to assess your risk of what I would call operational collapse, but it's operational continuity. Um, you want to identify how many drivers and attendants and substitutes you have who are high risk, according to DHHS. And then you want to identify all your potential staff that have school bus driver certificates and could be deployed in the event of a large portion of drivers becoming unavailable um, should you need them. You want to also consult human resources to determine your ability to require staff that have that certification to drive even if they're part of your teaching staff, because if 50% of your drivers are high risk and tomorrow none of them show up to work, it doesn't matter anything else, you won't be going to school. You have to have substitutes and you have to have a lot of them. Um, expect that what you have now is it. Expansion will be extraordinarily difficult. Um, behind the wheel training by school bus and traffic safety, that's three days of training usually includes three people across in those three days, it's now limited to one. So their training capacity presently is much, much smaller, which means that we'll hold our, they'll, they will most likely on DMV side hold their own, but until some of the restrictions on social distancing are lifted, they will not be able to expand your driving core. School bus modifications. No school bus is to be altered in appearance, color, lettering, or equipment unless authorized by the Department of Public Instruction, Transportation Services section. And this is a State Board of Education policy. We want to address the primary question that we have got, which is can we install plexiglass? The answer is no. Plexiglass installation would likely violate federal motor vehicle safety standards and introduce significant risk of injury or death in a collision. You should only use solutions from a school bus manufacturer, which have been approved also by DPI. Uh, they are working on these, but they're still in development by the OEMs. School bus preparations, post appropriate signage, mark seating areas to indicate where students should sit. If you're attempting to social distance, you need to mark those seating areas. Considerations for EC students. I put this higher in the presentation because I think it's pretty important. Those students have special needs and you'll need to make decisions based on each student's unique needs. You're going to need to consider what contract transportation might look like um, and define any clear rule, define clear rules for those contractors and consider what PPE you may need to protect those staff and students because it may be much greater than what you need for other students. Consult with nurses about changes for students with medical needs and consider mirroring how each school intends to handle each student. That will help move things along. School bus drivers and attendants should be trained on all newly developed practices and policies. So those policies related to transportation due to COVID-19, enforcement of the health and safety rules, what is their role going to be if a student gets up and changes seats um, and is no longer where they are supposed to be? What's their enforcement role? Leave policies and any required actions upon contact with a person who tests positive. So they need to know what their options are. Clear written instructions need to be provided on their daily self-screening or their district health screening. So if you're going to be there at 4 o'clock in the morning to take their temperature and get them on that bus and on their way, then you need they need to know what the procedure is going to be. If you're going to allow them to self-screen, they need to know what that procedure is supposed to be and what should cause them to not work that day. Expected personal hygiene practices, what you need them to do and when you need them to do it. Wash your hands after you get in the bus, before you get in the bus. 
when using hand sanitizer. Whatever those personal hygiene practices are, you need to tell them, and, and it needs to be written down. And then any additional duties. If they're going to be required to clean, they need to know how to do it and what is expected of them. Consider PPE for the bus drivers. Please note that none of the equipment may impact or restrict the driver's movement or impair the driver's vision in any way. But cloth face coverings or medical grade protection, if needed for certain populations or in certain circumstances, should be encouraged where medically appropriate for the driver. We would say that you should consider requiring it when loading and unloading because, again, everybody's going to be walking by them when loading and unloading. That would mean that you're also going to need to teach them how to take it on and off. Um, face shields should not be worn while driving. They're a glare risk. Um, many state DMVs have, have come out in that direction, but consider requiring them when loading and unloading. Gloves are not re recommended for general use, but may be needed for specific situations. If you envision them being needed for those situations, please provide training specific to glove use, removal, and hygiene. Those are very specific trainings for gloves, otherwise, because once gloves touch things, they just become your hands. Hand sanitizer, uh, we're recommending that you determine a method for issuing small quantities of hand sanitizer to staff or staff and students to comply with the NCDHHS requirement that they have it available to them. We would not recommend that school bus drivers be responsible for dispensing any chemicals or supervising and monitoring proper use of those chemicals by children. And we certainly would not recommend putting large quantities of that chemical because it is a flammable substance. Um, in the event of a collision, that could be a significant hazard to evacuation. Preparing students and parents. You want to let parents know of all their policies. You want to provide training materials on district processes, provide social distancing training to students, and advise students on proper bus stop etiquette. Um, you may want to tell them that they need to monitor what's going on at the bus stop more heavily than usual. Uh, otherwise, all the students at the bus stop may just be standing next to each other and playing games. Um, include social distancing guidance for the bus stop and encourage their support of that. Health pre-screening. Comply with DHHS requirements for pre-screening or parent attestation before boarding. Consult your board attorney on maintenance of confidentiality and what you might need to do. Adopt a policy on what is going to be done if a child does not provide the attestation or pass the screening process, whichever or both. And that policy may vary by age. What are you going to do if a kindergartner shows up without a parent at the bus stop, does not have the proper form, and cannot answer your questions and pass the screening process? What are you going to do with that kindergarten student? Consider an additional adult, an attendant, to screen and monitor students as recommended by DHHS. Uh, you may investigate if volunteers may be used to assist, but I have heard recently that uh, those volunteers may not be due to confidentiality. Choreograph those procedures with written instructions. Everybody needs written instructions, drivers, attendants, parents, students, and you need a seating chart for where everybody's going to be in case you need to do contact tracing. You may also wish to take attendance every single day. Add extra time to your route to accommodate provide enhanced PPE. If you do have a person doing per screening and accepting attestations, they are going to be close to the person. If they're close to that person, they may need enhanced protective equipment. Comply with DHHS cleaning requirements, um, but avoid scented products. We want to add that into our guidance. We also want to avoid the use of aerosols, um, and it is not recommended that PSUs make use of foggers or other dispensers which aerosolize chemicals or spread more chemicals that are necessary to clean and disinfect high-touch surfaces. Consider having professional janitorial staff perform most cleaning and disinfecting. And if you must perform that cleaning and disinfecting by with transportation staff, they need written instructions and training on the use of chemicals and equipment. I know everybody likes a disinfectant wipe, but if that disinfectant wipe says you have to keep the surface wet for 10 minutes, and you don't do that, you haven't done much. Loading and unloading. Load students from back to front. You may consider other options in plan A, like seating the younger students in the front. I know Wake County does that. Unload students front to back. 
provide bus tags for children to support safe and efficient departure boarding. As you talk about whether or not students are going to have to, uh, whether you need more bus runs, you're going to need to improve the turnover and the efficiency at the school. Consider color coding bus tags. Consider bus load and seat number information so that they know how to line up outside. They know I'm in seat 15 or eight, whatever it is, then it's easier for them to line up and not you know, have to negotiate with all the other children out there. Increase communications to the school to increase efficiency of multiple loads by the same bus. Let the bus, let the school know you're on your way back and to get load two for that bus prepared. With that, um, I thank you for all your time this morning. And uh, if you have further school bus transportation questions, uh, we're continuing to work on the issues of social distancing in school buses and other guidance as well as diagrams. And we should have uh, items related to those hopefully in the next week or so. Um, with that, I wanna turn it over to a similar but different transportation topic, driver's education with Carl Logan. Thank you, Kevin. In order to support the education of the whole child and to develop the student's passions and interests, it is important to consider maintaining extracurricular activities during the various reopening plans as much as possible. Also, although the uh, driver education program is considered an extracurricular activity, it may be offered at any time the district allows, not just before and after school or weekends. The program is designed to support and incorporate areas of the standard course of study. The program is unique being that it has two distinct phases which are offered in completely different learning environments and both present challenges of social distancing. Next slide. Moving forward, leadership will refer to the COVID-19 reopening phases as Plan A, Plan B and Plan C. The descriptions are as follows. Plan A is basically school operations as it was before COVID-19 with minimal social distancing. Plan B allows moderate school uh, social distancing uh, and if COVID-19 metrics worsen, additional requirements and or recommendations will be shared with you to ensure safety of students and staff. District will follow requirements and recommendations stated in the guidelines related to the school facilities and health precautions. They are encouraged to work with the local health agencies as some geographic areas may warrant additional precautions. On Plan C, currently our program is functioning within this plan, which allows remote and current uh, uh, visual, uh, virtual classrooms, uh, instructional opportunities, and however, it does not offer behind the wheel. Therefore, Plan C in, um, is where we are at the moment. In March of 2007, uh, 2020, Executive Order 117 closed all schools and activities. Since our school, since our program has uh, specific guidelines regarding classroom instruction, we had to cease all opportunities for traditional instruction. Some students have opted for the commercial school route to complete the program. This shall be at their own expense. To assist students with this option, districts are to create a process to execute uh, the required documents when they regain access to the facilities. In Plan B, we will most likely reopen in Plan B. We will advise if we are able to move forward uh, down the road to Plan A. The classroom of Plan A, um, in April, the State Board of Education amended the driver training requirements, Drive 004, to encourage remote learning across the state for the all North Carolina public school students to continue growth um, and well being during this public health crisis. Upon re entering, Districts are to apply the requirements and recommendations provided in this, in this document, which are the same for any other district classroom learning environment. Where available, encourage alternative methods to serve all the students. Districts may offer 
both traditional and virtual learning concurrently, which will assist in social distancing. Behind the wheel, this is where most of our challenges occur due to vehicle designs which cannot be altered without potential of compromising manufacturers' safety officials, uh, features. Also, there is a need for the teachers to be able to take control of the vehicle when the uh, situation warrants. However, Plan B allows districts to resume training while applying guidance from the various documents. Districts are encouraged to train and ensure drivers and teachers um, and students using a checklist that we will provide for the teachers. DPI will provide this teacher checklist to ensure that all safety guidelines are adhered to during the, this phase of training. Regarding special concerns and considerations, before COVID-19, the district was to provide reasonable accommodations for students with IEPs and 504 plans. However, the district is not obligated to provide such funds beyond what is provided for any other student or specifically not obligated to pay for an assessment of the physical minimum standards required other than the physical uh, minimum standards required by DMV. The district may use available resources, district or driver education funds to make these reasonable accommodations available. Driver education resources may not be used to pay for students seeking the program uh, for, for through non-commercial, excuse me, non-contracted commercial schools due to COVID-19 or other reasons. Additionally, the district is encouraged to identify vulnerable personnel and students to encourage them to stay home without penalty until they feel comfortable in resuming the program. Communication and combating misinformation. Although our program reaches or teaches risk assessment and risk management about driving, this concept must filter down into every other aspect of our lives, including COVID-19. Please continue to update yourselves and disseminate complete and accurate information to your teachers, students, and parents. Proper education and compliance are the key to public safety. So safety and health of students. Students should be encouraged to communicate with appropriate staff and alert them when their need is to stay home due to symptoms which may indicate possible um, cases of COVID-19. Districts should adjust their administrative guidelines to allow rescheduling of students without penalty, which should encourage them to stay home if warranted. The DPI driver education section will continue to provide normal methods of communications and resources, as well as updates from the appropriate agencies when available. Our next facilitator will be Dr. James Ellerby of School, Facil uh, School Facilities. Carl, thank you so much. And I am James Ellaby, and I will be doing a brief overview of school facilities, water and ventilation systems. North Carolina school facilities first closed in March of 2020 through the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year to curb the spread of COVID-19. As we prepare to transition back into the learning environment, school facilities need to provide a clean and safe environment for students and educators by creating a physical setting that is appropriate and adequate for learning. Improving the quality of the school facility will be an arduous task and ex an expensive undertaking. However, PSU actions will provide a safe, healthy environment and advance positive impacts for both employees and students within the school facility. What we know, we know that facilities matter. We do not take this lightly that a clean, safe, supportive building and environment helps impacts student performance. 
we want to address COVID-19 requirements in plans A and B. Plan C, we'd like to make you aware that the building is closed. However, it may still be open for staff. So some precautions may continue to need to occur. And finally, we want to always address legal counsel in our local areas for making decisions and especially those that we have questions. The topics that would be covered very briefly would be air quality, water quality, classroom size and space, signage, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing buildings and facilities, social distancing, safety drills, and the use of school build buildings and our facilities. For air quality, these are just recommendations. There are no requirements uh, made by NCDHHS, but ventilation, again, is super important. So at where you can, and if possible, open windows and allow a fresh flow of air to come through the building. And at all times, think about safety, because if you put yourself in jeopardy by opening a door or a window, please do not do so. Please make sure safety is the first priority in air quality. Water quality, these are recommendations. One, there's a website provided that you can go and look at all kinds of strategies for ensuring that you have drinkable and usable water in your schools. Classroom size and space. Again, there is a link that's provided, but the points that I'd like to emphasize are from DC NCDHHS requirements. And you can go see all those requirements at the current link. The main thing is hand washing, at least for 20 seconds, and hand sanitizer that is at least 60%. There's proper cleaning, disinfecting, and limiting the use of personal items are some of the key things that you will find in those requirements along with others. Signage requirements by NCDHHS. There's a link that is provided, but signage needs to be posted at the main entrance and the hallways and places that people are in high transition. We want to always remind students and staff they are um, to wear face coverings where and when it is appropriate and definitely stand six feet apart. Remember the three W's, wear, wait, and wash. The use of EPA approved disinfectants is essential. And then making sure that all the equipment that's used for cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing are properly stored. Social distancing, the NCDHHS requirements require that you provide some markings. As much as possible, mark six feet apart in spacing and ensure that there are also marks in the restrooms and your locker rooms, unessential visitors from coming into your school building or facility setting. Safety drills should continue to happen. We never know when there may be an emergency. So having students and staff members informed of where they're to report or what are they to do doing safety drills such as fire drills, tornado drills, and any other type of pertinent drills is essential as well. So please review your guidelines for a safety drill because again, safety matters and it's our number one priority. 
the use of school buildings and facilities, this requirement is to limit non-essential visitors and activities involving external groups or organizations. Also, we provided some additional considerations. The main one I like to point out is seeking your legal counsel for any policies or facility agreements or requirements that you may have. And also establishing a protocol for your visitors uh, to visit your organization, your um, school or facility. Finally, if you should have any questions, you may click the link that is at the bottom, NCDPI got its questions too. This link will allow you to submit questions so that we can also share additional information that you may have a concern about. Again, we want to take, thank you for your time today coming to this webinar. Again, I'm James Ellaby. I work with school facilities. We had uh, Kevin Harrison, who works with transportation, and Carl Logan, who works with driver's education. Please feel free to contact us in the question link should you have any more questions dealing with these topics. Have a great day.